Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to Sister Library. Today is Shruti Sabor reads uh, Sasha Mariana Saltzman. Um, so just a little bit about how Sister Library works. Um, it is a strange format, like I was saying, where uh, we don't, uh, not everybody who's here in the Zoom room has read the book. Actually, probably, has anyone read the book beside myself by Sasha uh, Mariana Saltzman? Raise your hand. No. Um, so the, I hope so. Uh, so. The idea is that um, the elder sister is assigned to read a book, um, and and brings to the reading selected parts of the book uh, that that she finds insightful um, in her own personal way. Uh, these are not academic uh, academic readings, um, and then the circle will read those passages and discuss um, the topics and the discussion is led by the elder sister. Um, the, the books are all collected uh, on the pink shelf at the Goethe Institute. Um, and it's really easy to become a member of, of, the, of the pink shelf and, and you can check them out uh, and enjoy them by themselves. The way that they're selected is uh, a little bit uh, personal depending on me and, and the cur and the co-curator Zoa, who's here. And then the Goethe Institute has a, a, a growing list of books that they, they always update. Um, so in this case, the book was selected uh, by the Goethe Institute. It's a translation from German. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that, that's kind of a little bit about the format. Um, we're also experimenting the idea of reading scholarships, so assigning books or, or opening up the list to people in different fields and having them read uh, and create something based on the reading. Um, so that, that will be coming up in the next month. Um, and the way that the Sister Library started is uh, as a project, as a community project by Akitami in Bombay. It's still running in India. Um, it has its own life, it has its own themes, its, uh, its own nature. Um, and but but we're we're very much sisters. Um, so with that with that I conclude the introduction to Sister Library, and I'll uh, read a little bit about um, the author of the book that we're going to read today. So Sasha Mariana Saltzman is a playwright, essayist, and curator. Her work has been translated and performed in more than twenty countries. Now twenty one or more than 20 plus Bangladesh. Um, her first novel, Beside Myself, which we're reading today, uh, won the Mara Kassen Prize and the Jürgen Ponto Schiftung Prize for the best debut novel and was shortlisted for the 2017 German Book Prize. Um, and I'm super excited to have Shruti Sabor here with us. I've been um, stalking her to be an elder sister for over two years uh, because she, she, she thinks and uh, writes uh, what she thinks and vocally and in a way that I, I it resonates a lot with with my my personal values and I think with the values of Sister Library. Um, so she's currently uh, an associate professor of anthropology at BRAC, uh, where she has worked since 2011. She obtained her PhD in sociology from the National University of Singapore and MA in cultural dynamics from Hiroshima University in Japan. Her core teaching interests include critical social theory, methodology, gender, class, kinship, and family. She has run a hybrid course titled Transnational Feminism, uh, Feminisms, Contexts, Conflicts, and Solidarity with University of Massachusetts in Boston. And currently she's working on her book called Marriage and Friendship, Social Networks of the Bangladeshi Affluent Middle Class. Um, so welcome Shruti, uh, and I pass it to you. Thank you, Katrina. Um, I'm really, really honored to be uh, chosen as an elder sister and um, talk about this book. Um, but uh, I, I must apologize because I was telling Katrina in every phase that this was probably one of the most difficult uh, novel I've read. Uh, difficult not in terms of um, story, but difficult uh, um, based on what I want to pick because it was very difficult to pick things that I, I really liked about the book. Um, it's a very, very sad, melancholic book, uh, but it also somehow very strangely resonant with me, um, <clears throat> partly because uh, Beside Myself is, um, 
is a story of four generations. Um, so I've I've started just to give you an idea. I have prepared a very small, like really short, not presentation. I want to open the discussion uh, with few slides, and then um, I'll move on to like the storytelling and things that I like. How about that? Okay, great. Um, can you just uh, can I share my screen? Is it visible? Uh, yeah, it is. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I can't see the book's name. <laughs> okay. Um, so this, the, you know the book name already. You know the author. Um, so this is what we are going to read. Um, and I had to put her photo because you, it, it's it's really important to for me to have the, like, even if you haven't read the book, to see the book and the author so that we can connect uh, who we are talking about and uh, place she is coming from. Um, so Sasha is actually, um, I mean, Ketrin already uh, gave a great introduction um, about her. I don't want to um, talk much about it, but it's very important to remember um, how uh, we as an academic or writer uh, create something from our very subjective perspective. So I think uh, to understand what beside myself is, is to actually read this excerpt where she talks about her name um, and she talks about how it's a like it starts with A, Ali, the character, and it actually a historical causality of B and C, a promise to history where um, undeniable, embedded, um, and uh, and also uh, being very aware is that not all of our subjective um, understanding or embodied history guides us in the same path. Um, so we see even in when she's writing, it resonates her own journey uh, from Volgograd to Moscow and then to Berlin and the lived experience she had. So essentially, this book is fictional, but at the same time, autobiographical. And uh, she's very aware that um, the people who made journey along with her are very different, have very different experiences. Some people are, um, they, they found their perfect life, um, listening to music, living, having perfect family, uh, meeting their family and friends, all of this. But uh, there are people like Ali and Anton, the characters of the book, who are constantly perturbed. Um, and we talk about spoils of partition uh, when we talk about partition in our subcontinent. But uh, I think what is not talked about are, um, is, is this post-Soviet uh, catastrophic experience of, of people had um, and the breaking and the borders, both personal and, um, and transnational. So these are the things that somehow resonate with, with me in a very, as I say, very strange way, because um, personally, I'm coming from a family who, who ideologically left leaning. So we had a very like intimate connection with Soviet Russia. We grew up with the stories, how socialist life would look like, it's look like, and when uh, after liberation, all, almost like during the liberation, what kind of uh, world that we were envisioning and how that world vision, world was um, constructed around the idea of socialism as well for many of us. <clears throat> of course, it was not a socialist country, but the, those stories are very familiar. The kind of lives uh, Sasha is talking about were very fa familiar. But of course, we were, we were hearing the stories out of propaganda or, or people, what was out there <clears throat> uh, from nationalist narrative. But uh, Sasha is coming from a very different place, and especially being a Jewish in um, Soviet Russia uh, was not very easy. We'll go to the next slide. Um, so about the book, and and the book is like this is this is Sasha's description of the book. So for me, the book was a very personal story um, and very personal personal history. Um, and that that history uh, embodies the history of the nation state, um, the transcending of borders, 
and how it kind of perturb uh, individual and who actually carries those spoils of those partitions or, or those divisions and carry intergenerationally. And it stays as a wound and, and this, this loss of um, homeland, the longing for home that doesn't exist. Is, is something that drives the people all their lives, not, not in their generation who have moved from there, but generations after that. Um, so, and, and she actually moves uh, the story uh, for your, um, so I, I kind of try to organize thematically. So the characters we see are essentially, the story is essentially intergenerational transnational and intersectional at the same time. What do I mean by that? Um, it is a story of four generations. So the story, those story starts with Ali or Alyssa, um, but it talks about their great grandparents, Alexander and Etinka, both of them were very, very famous doctors <clears throat> in Volgograd. And they were born between two revolutions in 1917 and um, their children, the, their, their daughter, Dania, <clears throat> Emma, and her husband, Dania, who is the great uh, grandparent of Ali, and their parents, uh, who were born in 1930s, and uh, Constantin and Valia, um, their parents, Ali and Anton's parents. So they were, they were born between 50s and 60s. And of course, uh, the character Ali and her brother, um, Anton, twin brother, Anton, who was born in 80s and moved to Germany in 90s. So why I, I wanted to put this in this manner is that so that you can at least uh, when I talk about this, this characters, you get to know, like get to see some of it. Um, for me, it was very important uh, to locate this characters. Um, and it it's very interesting is that how um, Sasha actually takes this character, their personal journey, and very complicated characters um, through the landscape of different nations. And not only nations, their biography um, actually merges with the nation's history or, or the, the spoils of <clears throat> border. So we see um, all these characters are like starting from USSR, uh, Volgograd, Alexander and Atinka were born around and, and live their lives and work as uh, doctors and professionals in Volgograd. Dania and Emma, their, um, Emma, their daughter, was a um, doctor as well who works in Volgograd and later moves to Moscow. And then um, Konstantin and Valia, they were living near Moscow and we see them moving to Germany later on. And with them, we see the whole family moving, uh, not only Ali and Anton or uh, Elias, their friend, but also um, Kostya and, or, or Konstantin and, and Valia's um, parents. So, and we also see this character moving not only from, uh, from USSR to Germany, but to Turkey as well. Um, and uh, Anton moves to Turkey, uh, leaving the family behind, trying to look for a home or trying to look for his identity. Um, and and her, his sister, Ali, actually goes after him and to look for him. And there we find this, this characters of Kamal or Kemal Bey, Elia's uncle, who's, um, who's a friend of Ali and, and his uncle, and Kato and Katrina, the transsexual dancer, and Alice Fling, and Aglaza, the singer, Katrina's friend, and Anton's muse. So these are the characters we'll be talking about. The story actually starts with going home. Um, and it starts with Ali. Um, I don't want to read the whole thing. I've just put it so that it's easier for you to um, at least read some bit of it. Um, so we, we, the story starts with this, this going back home. So it's like a homecoming. Um, and it's, it's not um, 
So Ali is, is clutching all this jam jar and, and uh, waiting and, and moving around where his brother, like her brother is, um, is really uh, working as a, how you call it, uh, like, like uh, as children would do, is fussing about. And uh, her mother is packing the things that they need or the provisions that they need for the journey. And if we see uh, them going out of the house from uh, Germany and, this is a specific um, uh, housing arrangement because these are the asylums. Uh, they're living in the asylums. And it's, it's very interesting how the smell of the asylum. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so the asylum smell and, and the precarity is, is very distinctive and Ali is always scared uh, to even go downstairs um, and their their neighbor actually asked them whether they're going home and whether it's first time and her uh, dad nods and and she's the the neighbor is is also a Jewish woman and dad begins to sing that it's time, it's time to rejoice. Um, so this is this is this is something I really, really um if you read the book, when it starts with such a joyful note, you realize how sad it is. Um, because the later part of the book it talks about uh how Ali and Anton would go back to Russia and face very different kind of discrimination by the Russian because they are Jewish. Um, even their best friends, they consider people their best friends, they will take the gifts for them and how they would be bitten up, bullied um, because of their identity, and especially because they are not only Jewish, but they were coming back and they 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 were the one who could uh leave the country. So this is something uh for me was was like when I, I moved like fast forward a few chapters, I was like, oh no. Uh they came back home, but the, that home is no more theirs. Um and that there's a there's a thing. Um the this the next chapter is talks about timelessness. How uh, when actually it talks about Ali's entrance to Turkey and uh, why she is there. So Ali is is, is this, uh, this this young woman who decides to leave everything behind in Germany and um, go to Turkey to look for her brother because only clue she has is the postcard. Her mother, Balia, has the postcard. Um, and uh, she decides that she wants to go and, and look for her brother. I mean, the, the address is also not there. Um, she's not only looking for her brother because, um, as a twin, um, the brother is so important and crucial because he's the mirror, the only person Ali can relate this journey with, not with the parents or any other generation. Um, it's, it's not only love and hate relationship with parents or, or love relationship with great parents or great grandparents, but it's, it's, it's the heaviness of of the experiences she can only share with Anton um the character Anton and Ali <clears throat> so she she arrives in um uh Kamala Atatürk airport and um the passport officer asks her uh how long she's staying and she answers she doesn't know um and they warn her that warn her or kind of suggest her that she can't stay more than three months um, and then she asked like whether it is there anything wrong with her passport because she's coming from Germany and that there shouldn't be any, any problem. But the uh, uh, the passport officers are talking about this trouble with this country with Russian import, the uh, women traffic from Russia. Um, and Ali really was perturbed because even after so many years living in Germany, uh, she's still marked as a Russian <clears throat> import. Um, that is something also, this is very subtly also telling that you can immigrate somewhere, but you don't become them, um, not to the other country or other nations. Um, and then she she retorts and, and talks about like, is there any way I can prove I'm not Russian whore? Um, and the, passport officers look look into her 
as a one man. I really like this, um, this line. Um, and she was waiting for someone. She was hoped that someone would come. And um, it was, and she finds Uncle Kamal stood um, in front of uh, the crowd um, receiving her. And it's very important to remember who this Kamal character was. Um, he's an idealist, obviously, a single man. Um, and she he has his background stories as well. Um, and the story is actually talking about um, basically how he's an idealist. He believes in People's Democratic Party, in Marx, in the possibility of change in Turkey. Um, and this is uh, this is around the time of uh, the Gezi Park uh, uprising. Um, so he's also connected, deeply connected or rooted into the ground level politics, even though he's very senior. Um, so, and, and he also believes in the people and goodness in the, in the people, and he's always willing to help. And we'll see, he becomes the father figure and home for Ali in Turkey uh, in so many ways. Um, and he actually believes that it's possible to find Anton um, in Turkey. Um, so the story actually is juxtaposed. So it, it, it is like a past, in the way it's organized, it's, it's like, uh, Ali is talking about her past, and then she, she's talking about her present. Um, and um, when she reaches Turkey, actually, she's not only on her second day, she's exposed to this underground life where um, you have this niche. Um, it's very interesting how nation is organized and, and it, it has its own underbelly. Um, so you do have like a Turkish touristic Turkey, uh, where you go, you go to the Sultan Ahmed Mosque, you go around Galata Bridge, you move around the landscape. So it is one of my favorite uh, cities as well. So for me, it was really, really interesting because I could associate um, with the with the city and the landscape as well. Um, and um, and and she she Kamal actually finds another guy and kind of introduce. Um, Ali to this underbelly where she finds this this amazing place where uh, the, uh, amazing place to live in Tarlabasi um, and uh, she goes to this this nightclub where you find this um, German speaking or Russian speaking people uh, there's a whole Russian ghetto where you get to um, buy Jifa and um, things that, uh, all the things that is Russian. Um, and she uh, gets, she get like when she's looking for Anton, she's 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 trying to like putting his name everywhere in the police station, even in the bar, writing his name. Um, and um, in the bar, she meets this dancer, Katrina. Uh, uh, and um, Katrina is it's a very interesting the way they they actually start uh, hitting up or or the, their hookup starts with the very conversation of speaking the dialect, of speaking the same language. It's it's not only Germany, German, but but um, specific kind of uh, Cyrillic and spe uh, spe specific kind of Russian, uh, especially Ukrainian. And um, Katrina, Katrina is only not the name, but there's a song uh, about Katrina and um, uh, and and how. Uh, that song sounds like a love song, but it was actually about the rocket launcher, which was named after Katrina. So Kat, Kat, it's for you as well. So I was reading and I was like, okay, now I know the name, uh, what it means. Um, and uh, so the story goes like that. And, um, and Ali actually, these are the two fundamental, um, uh, fundamental forces for Ali in, um, Turkey one is Katrina, um, the transgender man, uh, she, uh, and she's trans. She's transitioning into men, and um, meeting her, Ali actually start uh, realizing that it's not only the home, uh, the border that he has crossed from Russia to Germany and to Turkey. It's not the border of of geographical border that she straddles. Uh, across or um, uh, or or made this journey, but also she is not comfortable 
in her own body. Um, and she, she's not only looking for Anton here, but she's also looking for her own identity. What, what does it mean uh, to be what she is? Uh, what does it mean to embody certain kind of history? Where does she stand? So she actually, even Sasha also talks about this, uh, that she doesn't have a definite clear standpoint. She doesn't know where she is standing. So as a person, Ali is very, how you call it, um, I would say very vulnerable and resilient at the same time. Um, and um, this vulnerability comes from all this in, um, precarity and being unsure about yourself, but also it's a very gendered experience as well because Ali has always been, I mean, we'll look into, into the chapter, the chapter goes like next chapter, we see where it all begins. Ali actually cut her hair short when she, she's growing up. She actually ties her boobs. Uh, not really very female, even though she's very beautiful, but she she never felt like she's very comfortable with her femininity. Um, and was actually, Turkey gives her this, this place to explore what to become, what she wants to become. So in a way, it's not the Germany, the home that she has left or the Russia, but she finds new home in Turkey itself. Um, and she finds new friend like um, Katya or Katrina, Katyushka, um, and uh, Kemal. And, and of course she's looking for her brother, but at the same time, she's looking for a lost half of her as well, because she doesn't feel complete with the body or the history that, that she carries around. Um, so the story is the the story of uh, the search of for a brother is disrupted by the personal family histories as well, um, and I I really like this this part um, where she talks about this dead bird lying naked, uh, half demolished, and the smell of the table between them, and they are uh, traveling uh, in the carriage of Moscow Berlin train. Uh, for 36 hours, and, uh, and 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 I love this this part, this this visual that their parents are sewing on the 12 suitcases and even more boxes. They, and and also they have been told that they they're leaving for good. So um, Ali and Anton they played hor horsing around and paid no attention of their parents bickering or squalling. Um, that made them scream at each other all the time. And mother's father sat in next compartment pretending not to, not to hear or not to listen. So this is actually the, the first way out of, of uh, Russia. And it was during the 90s. Um, and mother's mother actually couldn't come. Uh, like all the partition story, all the, all the migration story, all the refugee story, the, this is always the cases that that somebody is moving before and somebody is following after um, and this 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 uh moving from one place to another finding a refuge becomes a constant battle for not only for one generation but over few generations <laughs> so we see the mother's mother um didn't come uh, emma she didn't come that Danielle came, but Emma didn't come. And she had to wait a bit to sell off their flat that they would never leave and say goodbye to friends and uh, prepare parents to move because uh, their great grandparents of Ali and Anton is also coming. Etinka. Um, so when they arrive next morning, uh, the, the world seems still, but Ali, uh, Ali, feels this, this, this constant rocking of 36 hours beneath her feet and, and births everything that she eats. And, and that is kind of a symbolically a refusal, uh, not really accepting the new land or not, not really being comfortable in a new place where Anton was, was quite happy to arrive somewhere new. And there were pauses and the gla glances exchanged and everyone so relieved to have arrived and one way or the another and um, having their suitcase intact and all, all the possessions they have and the children with them. 
Um, we will, I'll, I'll actually go back to the um, background because I, I personally, I like the family history and I, I, I would like to go in that direction. So I'll go back to uh, the character chart so that you remember because uh, I couldn't finish writing all the extracts that I wanted to, uh, but I will introduce uh, Valentina and Constantine. So Valentina and Constantine is the parents of uh, Ali and Anton. Um, and it's it's also like with a small small story. She's actually bringing up this this like a small time wrap or time bubble uh, for the audience as well, um, and and it also talks about like the ridiculousness of the naming uh, because Valentina and Constantine is very Russian name, um, and 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 it, she's asking like the writer is asking. Why would you name someone like that if you are not trying to hide the very fact that they, they were Jewish? So these two Rasify people were brought together as if love were something you could order and something that has best been ordered. If you didn't want to be beaten black and blue like uh, Valia in her first marriage. So Ali's mother Valia was married when she was 19 deeply and madly falling in love with a musician and she was bitten up and the marriage lasted only for a year and she was already pregnant and got the abortion um, and she comes back to not to her mother but uh, grandmother Atinka who was a doctor herself and uh, after after many conversations uh, well is parents actually decide to marry her off again because um and and at that point of time Valia was uh, studying medicine as well um so we see like three generations of medicine and all the girls are studying medicine uh and uh, the guys are either a doctor or they are um engineers so very like um how you call it um bourgeois in a in a socialist state uh kind of a place they were in, um, bourgeois professions, if not bourgeois itself, <clears throat> petty bourgeois professions. Um, so part, and it's very interesting. It was, uh, so Valentina was born, oh, she was named after Valentina Tereskova, the first astronomer, the female astronomer in Russia. Um, and, and it was in, she was born in 60s. And it's very interesting. Uh, 80s was still uh, in Russia was a like it is not yet perestroika time it was not about like uh, the, the federation is not breaking up it was a good time 80s was a good time 70s were, uh, were cold war 80s was relatively good time even then under the socialist regime uh, it's interesting how the gender relationship of men and women uh, pretty much stayed the same um, and even even if like the daughter is studying medicine but for them uh, the thought was that the daughter has to be provided for and who could have <laughs> yeah and 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 of course uh Constantine was was not a provider I mean like he, he was it was he was okay he was doing ends meet he actually wanted to be a musician and he has a long history of um sexual abuse by his uncle um but he is also um grew up in a village um near moscow um her parents were uh, his parents were not not really educated or 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 very different from Velia's family who were like three generation of education so um uh, constantine whether like it, it's not that he wanted to be violent, but uh, his his father was violent. To not not violent. I mean, they were very strict parents. Yeah, some somewhat violent as well. Strict parents, and uh, and they didn't want their son to be a musician or 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 somebody working in theater because they they've considered that uh, it's a fag's job. Or uh, if you are into culture, if you are into theater, you are uh, you are a uh, gay person you are not you are effeminate it, it's not you are not man enough so these two stories actually talks about uh uber masculine uh russian and and how women were uh, doing all the work both outside and inside the 
it is a talk about the masculine men and masculine women as well, even after under the socialist regime, the gender stratification was quite, uh, I would say quite stark. And um, it was very interesting to see that how they would want uh, men to be the provider, even when the women were earning more or equal in many cases. Um, and we see that there's a early nineties, there's, uh, there was, um, tank rolling out, um, there's a massive, massive, massive um, insurgencies and um, the whole family wanted to go to America and ended up being in Germany. Um, so this, this is, this is uh, something that, that uh, it's, the journey starts with that, but I will go back to actually, this one so that um, before I go back to Anton's problem or I, I will go uh, through each generation. So uh, we talked about the uh, Kostya and Valya, uh, but because of this, this, uh, this expectations uh, to Konstantin uh, about to become a man, he actually becomes this like, effeminate man who was trying really, really hard to become a man. Um, and one of the best way to be man is to be king wife. So Valia, a very successful doctor, but actually faced um, not only beating, but also marital rape. Um, and there are, and, and it, it's really interesting how through the stories of um, Constantin and Valia, we see from 80s, to, like from 60s to 90s, the gender expectations, the idea of romanticism were cult cultivated in, in uh, young ones. Um, so in, in movies and uh, so Valia is the first marriage. It, it, it's really, really beautiful, beautifully stated that you, you learn, there was, marriage was necessary in Russia. Um, and if there's emotion that is coupled with that, it's, it's great. But if it is not, it's not. But ma you have to be married. I mean, that, that, was, a, that was the expectation. And um, so in the film or in the cinema, there's this whole ideas of romantic love where the girl, uh, girl falls in love with boy, boy chase the girl. And, uh, and, and it ends up with a, this, this body crushing kiss uh, by the man very aggressively. And women are being like um, perplexed and surprised, but at the same time, uh, desiring that kind of attention. Um, so that is something really, really strike me uh, as opposed to what are the Russians saying is like proverbs are saying. Uh, I think one, one is that like, uh, if he beats you, he loves you. And the other proverb I really, really picked up from here is that if you are, if you have to be raped, uh, like if, if you are getting raped, you must relax. So these are like, this is the, these are the notion of love, sexual relationship uh, and expectation that is, that is inculcated in, in this Russian men and women. Um, so these are the, yeah, Katrina, I know. So those are the things. Um, so that's why when um, when the socialist parents, Danya and Emma, one doctor and another um, engineer, and their daughter, Valia, falls in life, love for the first time, was actually trying to be independent of, and getting out of this, this like this, this strict a straight jacketed family role and from parents who are busy or long, longing for a company and falls in love with this this um this musician and the, the first husband was a musician saxophonist and then end up having a bad relationship and poor thing go gets married like family arranges this marriage with a distant kin uh, of Constantin where the distant kin fellow Jewish like perfect Jewish match and it doesn't work out either. Uh, she doesn't, she doesn't like the guy. He was too hairy, fat, uncouth for her taste. Um, and also was loving at times, but most of the time, like really beating up, uh, trying to 
be chivalrous and all of this. Uh, and between that, two children were born and he sh and divorce was not very easy um, in Russia. Uh, so when they came to Germany after many, many, many years, um, they get divorced, um, Constantine and Valia. Uh, and Constantine commits suicide. Um, uh, and, and initially, I mean, he couldn't take the divorce. So they, they settled in Germany. Um, Valia worked for like six months without pay, like a slave. And then after that, she was making money. She was not only really making money, she was making very good money compared uh, six times more or 10 times more what she would make in Russia, even the current Russia. So, and at one point she, she, she thinks that enough is enough. So, you know, I'm done with this marriage. So she divorces and uh, Ali takes care of father. Uh, for the first few months, but he is a needy, typical Russian needy man, or typical man. I won't say Russian because I don't know like the real Russian, except from the book, uh, few of them. Um, but needy guy who, who needs a wife, who needs taken care of. So daughter takes care of her, but it, it is not enough. And so at one point, um, he actually, after divorce, he goes back um, to Russia to and think of settling down after her uh, parents' death. And um, he tries to sell the house that he, he had in Russia. Um, and when he's going, like, selling house, he was scammed. So he, he can't sell the house. Um, so his plan to actually live in Russia uh, is, is completely shattered. Uh, he comes back brokenhearted, but at the same time, we see like the, the, there's a backstory where uh, we see the children uh, were visiting Russia with the father, but it's very interesting. I, there's no mention of Valia going back to Russia, but, but it's always um, Constantine, because Constantine's mother was there and father came to Germany and then I think they got back, uh, was there. Uh, so after father's death, that the selling of the house and his own cousin uh, betrays him, uh, kind of betrays him, uh, Misha. Uh, so these are the stories and, and we see in the backdrop that uh, when they went to visit and meet their friends um they he really wanted to reconnect it, the few friends he had and he also remembers um the children and children actually remembers uh how they were treated i mean they they love being there uh at grandma grandparents place um because they had that that is the place that they left uh before germany and their height is written like uh, in 80, 87, how, how tall they were, in 90s, how tall they were. So there is a lot of um, uh, how you, tangible memory um, there, but their friends grow up and they were, the reason they have left Russia was, was because they were Jewish. And I'll come to the point why being Jewish is a problem or was a problem um, in late, uh, uh, 60s onward it became a problem uh, so so and then this this man come back to Germany brokenhearted after divorce not being able to sell anything and uh, not really making a lot of money uh, he works for BMW and he takes this leave like you know going back for eternity kind of a state then he comes back and then in one of the party he actually uh falls from the fifth floor and dies. Before that, he actually messages Ali constantly to, to reach out, to be with someone. And he was fine uh, because Ali actually found the job. The, after, after his divorce, he, she actually rented the house, like actually got him the big house. Um, and he was, he was happy that children would come and visit him. There'd be somebody, he probably would date someone. And he was actually, after, after divorce, he was dating someone. But then this out of depression, he, he just felt like heartbroken and, and 
really, really lost touch with the people he had because he only had his his wife and the children and um, not many friends. Um, and he he dies. And that had a huge impact on Ali. Ali holds herself responsible for somewhat for the divorce, less less of a div for divorce, but more for father's death. And that kind of breaks her. Um, and we we see how after the death, um, Ali Anton and, 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 and the mother, they come together. And there's this a very silent kind of, uh, how you call it, very somber um, and, and a very dark, bleak and almost noiseless, soundless, silent kind of uh, departure ritual they all have gone through. Um, and you see that this, like all of these characters are quite like depressed and trying to find their language to reconnect with each other. Um, because after divorce, Anton was responsible for mother and Ali was responsible for her father. And Anton was coming back to mother, staying with her, leaving her, uh, leaving her, uh, his girlfriend and staying with mother and eating and actually uh, going out with mother, getting like, totally pampered and all of this. So it take toll on them, not only the divorce, but but all of this, this chaos that they have uh, lived through. Um, so that that that's them. But also it's very interesting how Valia actually remembers the parents, the Emma and Dani, Dani, uh, Daniel. Um, and and they are they are the people born in thirties, um, and they they were the people who were like a ideal socialist family and ideal socialist kid. Um, so Valia remembers that she never actually heard her parents bickering. Um, her father was always available, taking care of the child. Her mother would go to spa if she needed, if she had long hours or traveling uh, around. Father will take care of her, and when father was not around, mother will help help her. And the equal share. So it, it's very interesting how um, the domestic role and the ideology also change within Russia. Um, so it, it's it's a pretty like it's it's a very comfortable. And and Danny actually fell in love with Emma and was really it was also a Jewish arranged marriage even though they were very different Dennis father was a, was a war veteran uh went to the second world war and comes back sorry uh yeah so second world war and comes back and Danny was an absolute brat without a father um but then he realizes and father was pretty um how you call it he, as a war veteran, he has seen so many deaths, and there were millions of people dying. Um, and and it's very interesting time, Danny and Emma's time is very interesting because we, if if we go to history, and I was going back to history while I was reading, is as as thirties is the time uh, when when Stalin came in power. Uh, mid thirties, late thirties, and um, not only came came in power, but uh, there were lots of oppression. Um, there were uh, uh, there's a huge famine which killed millions of people, and then Germany attacked Russia, and that killed a few millions of people. So it was quite war, not famine ravaged, war ravaged country uh, when Danny and Emma was growing up. Um, but at the same time, they had the subtle, um, subtle socialist belief and, and very firm in their ideologies and, and their, they were the ideal, perfect, loving uh, socialist subject who were caring for each other, caring for others as well. And so even in, 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 in that situation, and um, the family actually, Atinka and Alexander actually even though they were really, really high up in 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 uh, socialist hierarchy uh, after revolution, and early thirties, early thirties, mid forties, they were really, really influential people. But um, their influence 
actually waned because um, during that Stalin's time, and especially after Stalin's death or assassination of Stalin, uh, it was there was a rumor that it was um, Jewish people who killed Stalin. Um, so overnight, actually, uh, Emma's parents, uh, Emma's father, who was a director uh, general of of um, uh, health ministry, um, he loses job, even though he was a a very accomplished doctor who who served the war veterans who actually relentlessly worked almost like uh, uh, Emma was born under like the most crucial situation during the war and he he she actually marginally made it Emma was almost uh, like being st stillborn but um, Etinka actually and and uh, Alexander both um, made sure that. Emma is alive, especially at Gaia. And all of these stories are really, really interesting. Um, gives us this in interesting insight about the uh, what Russia was going through as well and how personally they, that was affecting them and their lives as well. So, uh, so I was talking about Daniel. And so Daniel, uh, Daniel or Daniel, or da yeah, Daniel, um, he was, he, and after after his father's return, he he actually his father actually never ever um, his father's friend uh, abused people. What? But he was he never actually killed anyone. N not kill anyone. He never abused anyone. Um, and when he came back, all he wanted is peace and quiet, and was really really trying to inculcate. Uh, the struggle that he has gone through during the war into his son, uh, Danny. And Danny, Danny really, really rejected his father because he he was this, for him, he was like, he grew up without father. So he was pretty much like, and, and quite a brat. And he was selling chocolate during the wartime, being cute and selling chocolate, picking pockets and things like that. So uh, from then there's something. And then his father actually, uh, really worried and he says like you know what um, do whatever you want to do but um, this is the money I have and I can give you one way ticket to the university if you get admitted great you stay there if you don't get admitted great you stay there never come back so he he takes Danny actually takes this one-way ticket and he made it through uh, he becomes one of the geologist or geological engineer something and then when he comes back uh he actually likes someone else but the family arranges marriage with emma uh, emma was a gorgeous girl and he immediately they actually immediately fell in love and that love continued so he was an engineer geologist uh living in volgograd emma was a doctor um and they had their child valia and they were living happily ever after um but it was <laughs> It was interesting because um, they they were living better, but the the anti Jewish anti Semitic um, uh, awareness or or anti Semitic uh, what do you call it sentiment was uh, sweeping a whole of Russia. And we see it started actually from Alexander and Etinka. So Alexander loses job in the 60s after Stalin's uh, death. And he actually, um, so they were given this, this beautiful house, house in Volgograd with uh, the, this party high officials. Uh, but Etinka actually continues. And she was in charge of uh, tuberculosis. So tuberculosis was killing millions of people. Like it was not hundreds and thousands, but millions of people. And, and children and her job was online as well for being Jewish, um, but she survived like somehow survives it um, and managed to work her way through um, being a very competent and efficient doctor. So, if you look into the history that this this white guard and and the this this anti Jewish sentiment kind of drove them and and even living uh, for hundreds and like for hundreds of years in Russia, it drove them away from Russia. Uh, and there are internal conflict. So we see this, this the fall of um, Stalin, oh sorry, death of Stalin 
and we uh, see Nikita Khrushchev's this mass mass industrialization and new kind of socialism. Um, we see the Cold War period. Uh, all these people are living through this time, and not only Cold Cold War, but the, this uh, Perestroika during Gorbachev's time, uh, and and this Warsaw Pact, and those those. Um, and also the nationalist movement throughout uh, Russia. Um, and, uh, and we see by Boris, Boris Yeltsin's time, the Re Russia was divided into um, new nation state and all the satellite state they acquired during the Cold War uh, actually uh, was fighting for their autonomy. So there are different kind of uh, there were different kind of nationalisms that was at work, and this people's uh, identity as Jewish uh, didn't help either. And we see this mass exodus. So some people, after Stalin's death, some people actually had this open ticket to uh, go to Israel. Some people moved to America uh, throughout seventies, uh, eighties, and nineties, and some actually ended up in Germany. Um, so this is the this is the family history part, and I really really want to wrap uh, with the story of Anton and um, Ali, uh, in a very strange, very very strange kind of a way. Uh, Anton and Ali departs. Um, they were inseparable, of course, as a twin, but they have this very very complicated sexual union. Um, I don't know how to put it. It's it's not incest, but it's an union, and they they were trying to look for something into each other, um, their other half. But somehow that one encounter actually breaks everything down. Um, so Anton, uh, it 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 makes Anton very clear that he wants to leave. Um, and he leaves and he actually, his plan was to go to New Zealand, which, which didn't work out because he didn't have enough money. So he moves from, um, he hitchhikes throughout Russia and then whatever money he had, he buys a one-way ticket to Turkey and there he goes. Uh, he actually, it's, it's very interesting. Anton is, uh, he's non-binary. Or uh, he's queer, but it is not articulated that he is queer. Um, so he had girlfriend, but when he uh, end up in um, in Turkey, he he ended up there in penniless. He was living with these homeless people um, and trying to make do with things. And uh, for he did actually multiple things. He uh, he stole. Um, he 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 labored for food um he actually um take up prostitution not not prostitution he he was into this this um into the business of uh phone sex or 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 like the verbal conversation the dirty talks and stuff um and then he finds this this artist who actually says that he's he's not he's very straight but fall in love with uh, Anton and uh, they, Anton actually kind of become uh, his, his kind of love or muse. Um, and Anton, Anton started to stay with, the, with him and they travel across, um, across the seaside. And uh, after a time, Anton realized that this is not what he wants. This, it was very comfortable. He was fed. He was taken care of. But he, he realized that he doesn't want that anymore. Um, then he goes back, um, and he goes back, uh, back to Turkey. Um, sorry, he was in Turkey, but uh, Istanbul. And in Istanbul, he actually falls in love with um, uh, this character, Aglaza. So Aglaza is a is a singer, um, Anton's muse, um, and and she was really really old and and possibly tra transformed as well. So she was she was old. He falls in love, um, and 
Aglaza actually likes him back, but he uh it it's it's he he meets when this this whole Gezi Park massacre was going on and Azala uh actually um she she is part of the protest as she takes part of the in, in part of the protest and she was she was all over the news um and uh, tear gas uh, shell actually hits anton and anton's boyfriend then boyfriend and axala as well uh so actually anton finds axala in gezi park um mm-hmm. uh, in the massacre and um and it's very interesting uh from the story, you can deduce that uh, Anton and uh, Alisa were meeting this these two friends. Axala was Katya's friend, so Katya um, Anton knew Katya and Axala, and Kat, Katya had uh, had very intimate relationship and 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 possibly sexual relationship with Axala as well. Um, they were they their life they were friends with benefit I would rather say, so they they had a very intimate relationship and um, that 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 revolves around this nightclub where Azala used to sing where the first scene where um, uh, Ali meets Katya in the same same place so it seems like Anton and Ali missed each other uh, it's a strangely missed each other because. Um, when Axala was in the hospital, Katya was the one who was taking care of Axala. And um, uh, when he was getting, she was getting better, Anton actually proposed her to get married. And then I, he realized that he wants to get married and he doesn't want anyone else either. Um, so he's, he's he wants to get married and also pushing, Axala was not pushing him, but opening opening herself um and he talks about like how um she was not from and she was a girl she was she was not trans so how about her family and this this romanian her hungarian and romanian parents and this this whole circus and how they moved all over the europe how mother died actually mother had a had a accident um in circus and dies and how her father was interested in her sister and loved her very much in very many ways. Um, and how Axala always wanted her father's love and never got it and um, was abandoned by her parents, was living with the living with her aunt, and um how how that impacted her. So she she studied, but at the same time, she she wanted to get away from everything, and she ended up being in Istanbul. So the the stories, um, this complex stories actually disturbs Anton, and Anton wants to leave everything and go back to Germany, uh, back to Germany, and uh, at the same time, parallelly, we see that uh, Katya and um, Ali are 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 their fling gets into like takes shape into a real relationship um but ali is also pushing katya out and she's ready to leave germany as well um yeah so it's very interesting how um like ali never finds anton but she becomes anton because with katya she starts taking these drugs um and there's a there's a beautiful story about a, a man with a um uh, this this bird the singing bird um there's this illegal singing bird um whose bird singing in a cage and they can only sing in the cage in the dark so it kind of talks about their darkness and the stories and the, their beautiful narratives as well and uh and Ali actually ends at the, the last last scene of the book ends Ali dreaming of Katya leaving her um, and and this the songbirds that Katya is looking into and Ali wakes up in in Kamal's house uh, in Kamal's arm um, and there was a outside there's a this massive uprising there's a tear gas gas jail there's a tank all around. Um, and Anton, Anton is looking into this, this from a very treetop, looking into the stadium and looking into this park where Ali actually comes to look for Katya. 
but strangely they never meet each other and that's where the story ends so ali uh, and throughout the story um, ali started taking the uh, sex changing drug and uh, she actually eventually becomes anton so that is that is where the story ends I did not see that coming. I didn't see that coming either. Wow. Okay, I'm done. You can ask anything you want to ask. Oh, wow. That's that's a you can feel that she's a playwright. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very green book. You get depressed. I got depressed. I was oh. like, I was dealing with so much, you know, Katrina, what I was dealing with for the last two weeks. <laughs> and then, then like, it was never ending. It's like, come on, give me a ha something to be happy, something to look forward to. But yeah. The, 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 the few, did the end give you that? Did no. Her... no, 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 not at all. It's like, yeah. It's, I, I, I don't know, I felt really deeply, deeply sad. Uh, the, the part I really love about the book is the family history and this, this multiple layer. I simplified it in so many ways because there's so many other characters, it's impossible to keep track. That's why I had to make that, that tree. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can tell why. But it, with, what was interesting and why I asked you, I haven't read the book, uh, but why I, what I knew about it made me think of you because of these four generations and how um, in each generation, the, the idea of marriage and the idea of love and individuality changes so drastically. Yes. And I, and I was wondering how your research into kinship um, and marriage uh, and class would um, would play into this like what are what are your insights and in, in, in what you're seeing happening in Bangladeshi families um, um, yeah so so one of the things that that uh, it I I see that uh, being a Jewish and be, being in a high up position how um, just because the like one part of intersectionality because of your religion your social position, can degrade over the generation, and and if if the story starts with Etinka and um, and uh, not Constantine Alexander, right? So Etinka and Alexander, who were like this this very close to power, very powerful people, how being Jewish changes everything, um, and how this this perfectly happy family end up uh, having marriage of convenience. Uh, over the generation and uh, how that because their Jewishness was not important when they got married the first generation um, by second generation it was arranged marriage and it was arranged marriage precisely because of this because of the, the social precarity um, and they they opted for like you know sticking up together uh, even the match was not that great in terms of social position of of the of the um of the groom um but it, so that that is something that that was really interesting for me um it doesn't match with Bangladeshi cases because of course it is it is a very different different history but i think um what my takeaway from this is that any like because we wear multiple hats um as a human being we wear class we wear uh, religion, we wear our age, we wear our education and experiences. So if one of the things are not aligning with the with the typical um, uh, like typical way of uh, counting the social, uh, status quo and, and and put you in the position, um, your whole world can crumble down. So we see that that is exactly what is happening is like in four generations, they're, they're 
their family life and their the professional life is still intact their familial life crumbles down and it gets heavier and and the gender relation becomes hierarchical with each passing generation that is, that is something that that was very different from what we have here um but also it made me think about right about my own book as well because it's it's an academic book but at the same time like how domesticity um gender roles changes over the period of time so even within a socialist society uh people living in in early 20s and 30s uh post revolutionary world and then then uh stalin world and the, then the the perestroika world the lives are absolutely different even even in russia so that is something really really exciting for me because from outsider uh, when we were lo looking into history, so my father actually uh, stayed that that volatile period of eighty seven. My father was there, so my father was there for seven, almost for six six months, uh, and he was in Odessa. So it was it was really interesting for for them. It was still this like you know uh, all this. Uh, party politburo, all this high officials having like a good life and all of this, but down below the lives were changing very, very fast. So by the time he returned to Bangladesh, the Berlin Wall fell and the whole world uh, started to crumble. Um, so I think it's a, it's a um, weight of history. Um, how it kind of, um, so I, I think how we carry the weight of history in our personal lives, um, that, is, that is something that is very similar. Even yeah. though the history is very different, it's a socialist world, this, this was like a post-colonial world, the histories are very different, but I think one thing is common is that how we carry our uh, family wound, our joy, our memory, how we transcend boundary of time and space, how we live in a continuum. We, are, we, we transcend, but we keep coming back. I think that is something um, I would say is very similar because of, uh, from my book, uh, I don't wanna talk about too much because I'm like, I'm still halfway through, uh, but my book is also talking about four generations and, and the shift in the, in the gender role shift in the fem, uh, domestic role and 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 also like the national history and the personal history. Yes, Tabasum wanted to talk about something. Please that was me, go on. Hello, it was really nice to hear you. Really, I loved the discussion. It reminded me that uh, I was in a bookstore uh, in Germany uh, one year ago, six months ago, and they were discussing another book by Sasha. Actually, it, it, it's, I think it's an essay in an anthology which also deals with uh, some aspects of home and how do we really define home so it was very similar to that discussion and the points you brought up uh, actually reminded me of that session because uh, the whole anthology talked about how people perceive home and Sasha in that uh, anthology essay, she also talked about uh, how home is not exactly a geographical place, but anything that does not make you feel alien. So I really loved the definition she used in that anthology, but I also had a question for you, because when I was uh, reading the book, uh, this book, I felt like the author questions uh, continuously that is language enough to articulate what we are thinking or what emotions we have. She, of course, doesn't like give a clear answer or, or I didn't find a clear answer to it. But as an anthropologist or like as a reader of the book, what do you feel that is language actually enough uh, to articulate all we feel or all of our emotions? No, I don't think so. I don't think so because I can speak Bangla and I have I have this problem. It's not only German or or Russian. Because you uh, if you have read the book, probably you will see how um, how Katrina, uh, the trans man woman, um, as as uh, they are connecting through their language, Russian they're they're bringing about their memories and the songs and the bits and pieces and they're connecting but after connection um they long for each other katrina more but you see ali feels it's not enough 
So if language was the base of connection, it would have been enough, right? It was not, right? So that is something, but also uh, like I, I prefer to speak in Bangla and uh, I, I won't say that I write very good Bangla, but I think my, my articulation in Bangla is um, when I talk, and the way I think, I think it's it, it's much richer than my English in so many ways, but I can't like, I have, I can count literally five people who would speak in that, that level of Bangla. So if my father is no more, I don't think I would have that connection with my language. Uh, and uh, there are two other writer I really, really love, Shagufta, my friend, Shagufta Sharmin. She's an author and a, so she's the only one uh, with whose language I can relate to as a novelist, as a writer. I mean, there are many Bangla great books, but you know how you connect with the memory, like small pieces, the, the, the way she's articulating the smell of a place or, or a landscape or, or the, the midday nap for children, right? Like the small, small things, I think, I think language is not enough. Um, language definitely gives you a base uh, for building the bridge, but we carry so much of personal history yeah. that it, it, it is never enough. And, I, and again, I think like her being a playwright um, helps her transcend that not enough yeah. I've, never, I've never seen her plays but but from what I, I I've the little that I have experienced um it is experimental theater and and there you can go beyond language yeah and I also I think uh, she's also open to interpretation uh I think many of her work is uh, I was reading uh, apart from this re reading like short short excerpts of of things she has written and the, and the play uh I think I think the I, I talk about ontology and epistemology all the time is that how we live our life as is the base of what we create. And and the life that she has lived has essentially given to it this, this particular art form or narrative form, which is very unique to her and not unique at the same time, because we still can relate. To, to that, um, yeah, that is that is something that I felt when I was reading. Well, uh, thank you, thank you so much for reading it, and thank you for for taking us through it. I feel a little bit guilty because I guess I could relate the most. Most, yes, right? yeah. Um, and I I think uh, if if and when you get time and when you read it, I I would like to have a have a chat over coffee at some point because yeah I'm happy to have a chat just based on your retelling because there were so many points where it was just like I have like either similar family history or I know people who have had similar family history I have one last question before we close the session um and it's about the title of the book uh because it's so beside myself um it, it it's so open ended and the, and there is a sadness to it that's kind of hard to put your finger on um but at the same time it's like there's a strength so it's like you've got yourself but what do you think um what do you, well, how do you interpret it now that I, you're I think as a person sasha is alona <laughs> <laughs> even when when i was listening to her when i was looking into her videos um there's there's a very deep embedded uh but i think we are all living in our own islands as well i mean we are, we can be very extrovert but end of the day we are beside ourselves and some some people but i and, and she writes this book in istanbul actually she 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 was writing this book uh, in istanbul so istanbul was her home um so when i was listening to her uh, other interview and she was talking about like how istanbul become the became the home where she finally feels settled so i think this whole book especially it's a first book she wanted to she and I, I i have the same problem is that she she wants to put everything in one book right 
So there's a there's a certain pressure of of getting getting things out. I think she's much more relaxed and happier person after writing this book. <laughs> Because there's so much, so much emotion bottled up. Um, but um, end of the day, she is beside herself because she never finds Anton, the person that she, she yeah. loves the most, cares for the most. And there are beautiful, be beautiful stories. I actually opted because I was really, really thinking through how to, how to put put it and how best I can narrate, like not only take telling the story, but also bringing my perspective. But you know, your book, you can do the justice, but if you're reading someone else's book and you're, it's not enough, it's never enough. It's not exactly what they want, but how you read it. Um, but one of the things that I really, really like is that how it's not one side of story. So uh, she writes about uh, her parents, but we hear the story from Valia, uh, from Kato. <laughs> from their perspective so there's like a story and then, and then the constant like narrative and counter narrative so every story has a counter narrative so she has her story and i'm done telling about her um so that kind of gives us a better perspective but also she's pro because it's all her writing so she's actually putting the shoe different shoes <laughs> explaining the same story so uh, yeah but i think it, it's even it's 366 pages and it's it's way dense, way dense. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a it's a lot for generations. And I'm I'm sure people would be hating really like hate if my book ever comes out because it's about multiple generations. I was like, ah, oh, yeah, exactly. That was my problem too when I was writing. When I'm writing it, it's becoming very very difficult because. You want to have everything you want to, and you want to give like a very, like, you see the world and you yeah. want to inherit the world, but, but rest of the people don't have the time and energy and didn't have gone through that experiences. So. <laughs> well, I'm glad that that made you reflect on, on that. Um, and when is, when is your book coming out? Not I don't know, Katrina, I wanted to finish it this year, but like, I'm like, it's March already. I, I couldn't even look into the manuscript. Someday, someday. Crossing. Someday. Well, when it comes out, we'll have another reading. Yes. Uh, I'll talk about my book. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yes. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. And with this, I am done with my spring commitment. <laughs> yes. So for me, this is like a spring, like whole of spring. So this is this is the last assignment for, for spring. Free. Free. Not free. I have other work. But now for me now, spring is over. Spring is over. Welcome summer. Yeah, welcome summer. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Thank you. Well, I hope to see you soon. Zoa. Bye. 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 Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, Onona, for being there and Jukto. Onona is my student. Miss. She's, yes. Yes. So good to see you. Okay. You take care. I'll talk to you later. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Bye. 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 Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye.